Carmilla by J. Sheridan Le Fanning Read by Elizabeth Clett Chapter 9 The Doctor As Carmilla would not hear of an attendant sleeping in her room, my father arranged that a servant should sleep outside her door, so that she would not attempt to make another such excursion without being arrested at her own door. That night passed quietly, and next morning early the doctor, whom my father had sent for without telling me a word about it, arrived to see me. Madame accompanied me to the library, and there the grave little doctor, with white hair and spectacles, whom I mentioned before, was waiting to receive me. I told him my story, and as I proceeded he grew graver and graver. We were standing, he and I, in the recess of one of the windows, facing one another. When my statement was over, he leaned with his shoulders against the wall, and with his eyes fixed on me earnestly, with an interest in which was a dash of horror. After a minute's reflection, he asked Madame if he could see my father. He was sent for accordingly, and as he entered, smiling, he said, "'I dare say, doctor, you are going to tell me that I am an old fool for having brought you here. I hope I am.' But his smile faded into shadow as the doctor, with a very grave face, beckoned to him. He and the doctor talked for some time in the same recess where I had just conferred with the physician. It seemed an earnest and argumentative conversation. The room is very large, and I and Madame stood together, burning with curiosity, at the farther end. Not a word could we hear, however, for they spoke in a very low tone, and the deep recess of the window quite concealed the doctor from view, and very nearly my father, whose foot, arm, and shoulder only we could see, and the voices were, I suppose, all the less audible for the sort of closet which the thick wall and window formed. After a time my father's face looked into the room. It was pale, thoughtful, and, I fancied, agitated. "'Laura, dear, come here for a moment. Madame, we shan't trouble you, the doctor says, at present.' Accordingly I approached, for the first time a little alarmed, for although I felt very weak, I did not feel ill. And strength, one always fancies, is a thing that may be picked up when we please. My father held out his hand to me, as I drew near, but he was looking at the doctor, and he said, "'It certainly is very odd. I don't understand it quite. Laura, come here, dear. Now attend to Dr. Spielsberg, and recollect yourself.' "'You mentioned a sensation like that of two needles piercing the skin, somewhere about your neck, on the night when you first experienced your horrible dream. Is there still any soreness?' "'None at all,' I answered. "'Can you indicate with your finger about the point at which you think this occurred?' "'Very little below my throat. Here,' I answered. I wore a morning dress which covered the place I pointed to. "'Now you can satisfy yourself,' said the doctor. "'You won't mind your papa's lowering your dress a very little. It is necessary to detect a symptom of the complaint under which you have been suffering.' I acquiesced. It was only an inch or two below the edge of my collar. "'God bless me! So it is!' exclaimed my father, growing pale. "'You see it now with your own eyes,' said the doctor, with a gloomy triumph. "'What is it?' I exclaimed, beginning to be frightened. "'Nothing, my dear young lady, but a small blue spot, about the size of the tip of your little finger. And now,' he continued, turning to Papa, the question is, what is best to be done? Is there any danger? I urged, in great trepidation. I trust not, my dear, answered the doctor. I don't see why you should not recover. I don't see why you should not immediately begin to get better. That is the point at which the sense of strangulation begins. Yes, I answered. And recollect as well as you can— the same point was a kind of centre of that thrill which you described just now, like the current of a cold stream running against you. It may have been. I think it was. Aye, you see, 
he added, turning to my father. "'Shall I say a word to madame?' "'Certainly,' said my father. He called madame to him, and said, "'I find my young friend here far from well. It won't be of any great consequence, I hope, but it will be necessary that some steps be taken, which I will explain by and by. But in the meantime, madame, you will be so good as to not let Miss Laura be alone for one moment. That is the only direction I need give for the present. It is indispensable.' "'We may rely upon your kindness, madame, I know,' added my father. Madame satisfied him eagerly. "'And you, dear Laura, I know you will observe the doctor's direction. "'I shall have to ask your opinion upon another patient, "'whose symptoms slightly resemble those of my daughter, "'that have just been detailed to you, "'very much milder in degree, "'but I believe quite of the same sort. "'She is a young lady, our guest.' But as you say you will be passing this way again this evening, you can't do better than take your supper here, and you can then see her. She does not come down till the afternoon. "'I thank you,' said the doctor. "'I shall be with you, then, at about seven this evening.' And then they repeated their directions to me and Madame, and with this parting charge my father left us, and walked out with the doctor, and I saw them pacing together up and down between the road and the moat, on the grassy platform in front of the castle, evidently absorbed in earnest conversation. The doctor did not return. I saw him mount his horse there, take his leave, and ride away eastward through the forest. Nearly at the same time I saw the man arrive from Dranfield with the letters, and dismount and hand the bag to my father. In the meantime, Madame and I were both busy, lost in conjecture as to the reasons of the singular and earnest direction which the doctor and my father had concurred in imposing. Madame, as she afterwards told me, was afraid the doctor apprehended a sudden seizure, and that without prompt assistance I might either lose my life in a fit, or at least be seriously hurt. The interpretation did not strike me, and I fancied, perhaps luckily for my nerves, that the arrangement was prescribed simply to secure a companion— who would prevent my taking too much exercise, or eating unripe fruit, or doing any of the fifty foolish things to which young people are supposed to be prone. About half an hour after my father came in, he had a letter in his hand, and said, "'This letter had been delayed. It is from General Spielsdorf. He might have been here yesterday. He may not come until to-morrow, or he may be here to-day.' He put the letter into my hand, but he did not look pleased as he used when a guest, especially one so much loved as the general, was coming. On the contrary, he looked as if he wished him at the bottom of the Red Sea. There was plainly something on his mind which he did not choose to divulge. "'Papa, darling, will you tell me this?' said I, suddenly laying my hand on his arm, and looking, I am sure, imploringly in his face. "'Perhaps,' he answered, smoothing my hair caressingly over my eyes. Does the doctor think me very ill? No, dear. He thinks, if right steps are taken, you will be quite well again, at least on the high road to a complete recovery in a day or two, he answered a little dryly. I wish our good friend, the general, had chosen any other time. That is, I wish you had been perfectly well to receive him. But do tell me, Papa, I insisted, what does he think is the matter with me? Nothing. "'You must not plague me with questions,' he answered, with more irritation than I ever remember him to have displayed before. And seeing that I looked wounded, I suppose, he kissed me, and added, "'You shall know all about it in a day or two. That is, all that I know. In the meantime you are not to trouble your head about it.' He turned and left the room, but came back before I had done wondering and puzzling over the oddity of all this. It was merely to say that he was going to Karnstein— and had ordered the carriage to be ready at twelve, and that I and Madame should accompany him. He was going to see the priest who lived near those picturesque grounds, upon business, and as Carmilla had never seen them, she could follow, when she came down, with Mademoiselle, who would bring materials for what you call a picnic, which might be laid for us in the ruined castle. At twelve o'clock, accordingly, I was ready, and not long after, my father, Madame, and I set out upon our projected drive. Passing the drawbridge, we turned to the right, and followed the road over the steep Gothic bridge, westward, 
to reach the deserted village and ruined castle of Karnstein. No sylvan drive can be fancied prettier. The ground breaks into gentle hills and hollows, all clothed with beautiful wood, totally destitute of the comparative formality which artificial planting and early culture and pruning impart. The irregularities of the ground often lead the road out of its course, and cause it to wind beautifully round the sides of broken hollows and the steeper sides of the hills, among varieties of ground almost inexhaustible. Turning one of these points, we suddenly encountered our old friend, the general, riding towards us attended by a mounted servant. His portmanteaus were following in a hired wagon, such as we term a cart. The general dismounted as we pulled up, and after the usual greetings, was easily persuaded to accept the vacant seat in the carriage, and send his horse on with his servant to the Schloss. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 Bereaved It was about ten months since we had last seen him, but that time had sufficed to make an alteration of years in his appearance. He had grown thinner. Something of gloom and anxiety had taken the place of that cordial serenity which used to characterize his features. His dark blue eyes, always penetrating, now gleamed with a sterner light from under his shaggy gray eyebrows. It was not such a change as grief alone usually induces, and angrier passions seemed to have had their share in bringing it about. We had not long resumed our drive, when the general began to talk, with his usual soldierly directness, of the bereavement, as he termed it, which he had sustained in the death of his beloved niece and ward. And he then broke out in a tone of intense bitterness and fury, inveighing against the hellish arts to which she had fallen a victim, and expressing, with more exasperation than piety, his wonder that heaven should tolerate so monstrous an indulgence of the lusts and malignity of hell. My father, who saw at once that something very extraordinary had befallen, asked him, if not too painful to him, to detail the circumstances which he thought justified the strong terms in which he expressed himself. "'I should tell you with all pleasure,' said the general but you would not believe me. "'Why should I not?' he asked. "'Because,' he answered testily, "'you believe in nothing but what consists with your own prejudices and illusions. I remember when I was like you, but I have learned better.' "'Try me,' said my father. "'I am not such a dogmatist as you suppose.' Besides which, I very well know that you generally require proof for what you believe, and am therefore very strongly predisposed to respect your conclusions. You are right in supposing that I have not been led lightly into a belief in the marvellous, for what I have experienced is marvellous, and I have been forced by extraordinary evidence to credit that which ran counter, diametrically, to all my theories. I have been made the dupe of a preternatural conspiracy. Notwithstanding his professions of confidence in the general's penetration, I saw my father at this point glance at the general, with, as I thought, a marked suspicion of his sanity. The general did not see it, luckily. He was looking gloomily and curiously into the glades and vistas of the woods that were opening before us. "'You are going to the ruins of Karnstein,' he said. "'Yes.' It is a lucky coincidence. Do you know I was going to ask you to bring me there to inspect them? I have a special object in exploring. There is a ruined chapel, ain't there, with a great many tombs of that extinct family? So there are. Highly interesting, said my father. I hope you are thinking of claiming the title and estates? My father said this gaily, but the general did not recollect the laugh— or even the smile which courtesy exacts for a friend's joke. On the contrary, he looked grave, and even fierce, ruminating on a matter that stirred his anger and horror. "'Something very different,' he said gruffly. "'I mean to unearth some of those fine people. I hope, by God's blessing, to accomplish a pious sacrilege here, which will relieve our earth of certain monsters, and enable honest people to sleep in their beds without being assailed by murderers. I have strange things to tell you, my dear friend, 
such as I myself would have scouted as incredible a few months since. My father looked at him again, but this time not with a glance of suspicion, with an eye, rather, of keen intelligence and alarm. "'The house of Karnstein,' he said, "'has been long extinct. A hundred years, at least. My dear wife was maternally descended from the Karnsteins. But the name and title have long ceased to exist. The castle is a ruin. The very village is deserted. It is fifty years since the smoke of a chimney was seen there. Not a roof left. Quite true. I have heard a great deal about that since I last saw you, a great deal that will astonish you. But I had better relate everything in the order in which it occurred, said the general. You saw my dear ward, my child, I may call her. No creature could have been more beautiful, and only three months ago none more blooming. Yes, poor thing. When I saw her last she certainly was quite lovely, said my father. I was grieved and shocked more than I can tell you, my dear friend. I knew what a blow it was to you. He took the general's hand, and they exchanged a kind pressure. Tears gathered in the old soldier's eyes. He did not seek to conceal them. He said, "'We have been very old friends. I knew you would feel for me, childless as I am. She had become an object of very near interest to me, and repaid my care by an affection that cheered my home and made my life happy. That is all gone. The years that remain to me on earth may not be very long, but by God's mercy I hope to accomplish a service to mankind before I die, and to subserve the vengeance of heaven upon the fiends who have murdered my poor child in the spring of her hopes and beauty. "'You said just now that you intended relating everything as it occurred,' said my father. "'Pray do, I assure you that it is not mere curiosity that prompts me.' By this time we had reached the point at which the Drunstall Road, by which the general had come, diverges from the road which we were travelling to Karnstein. "'How far is it to the ruins?' inquired the general, looking anxiously forward. "'About half a league,' answered my father. "'Pray, let us hear the story you were so good as to promise.'" End of chapter 10